So I'm Sam Meister. I'm the, the Preservation Communities Manager at Educopia, um, the home of the Big Curator Consortium, where I work very closely with, with all people involved with the consortium. And today we got a great lineup of people, uh, BCC members, who have had uh, levels of experience using implementing Cryoflux in their workflows. Um, so we're going to start off uh, with uh, an introduction to Cryoflux for those of you who um, haven't investigated it or have and would, haven't, love, would love more. more, more. Um, um, and, uh, and then we're going to go into a series of, of case studies from, from Dorothy at Emory University, Farrell at Duke University, and Walker Sampson over at uh, UC Boulder. Um, and then uh, we, we've time things, so we should have at least 10, if not 15 minutes at the end for, for questions um, from you all. So with that, I'm going to pass it on the presenter privileges to Walker to take over. Go for it, Walker. All right. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Sam. Um, so yeah, as Sam was saying, uh, we thought it would be useful before we jumped into the case studies to just talk about uh, the Cryoflux board and software more generally, everything from documentation to how it works and uh, why you would use it. So um, I'll start on that last uh, point. So in comparison to um, some other floppy disk controllers, um, what is uh, particularly um, useful about Cryoflux um, is its ability to sample uh, what you can call the raw track data or the fluxes on the platter of the floppy disk. So at a very low level, the device is uh, sampling the uh, fluctuations in the uh, bit cells on the platter. And um, while that is not especially useful in and of itself, um, because the device is capturing data at that lower level, um, it does allow an archivist or, or uh, somebody processing at a special collections or archives to separate the act of capturing the data from the act of interpreting the data. And that can be very useful if you've got problematic disk or you're trying to do some batch process, processes, as we'll touch on later. Um, along with that, um, when you have that raw track data, uh, it does allow you to uh, run multiple disk image types or sector formats against that track data um, uh, many times. Uh, you can even customize uh, the particular type of disk image that you're tr trying to uh, create. And you can do that without respinning the disk, which from a preservation standpoint is, um, is very nice. And again, that's also that you can try to get a, a mountable disk image. Um, <clears throat> as a floppy disk controller, it can uh, be used with five and a quarter, three and a half, um, along with selected three and eight inch drives. I know the latter does need additional equipment, but the larger point being that the device can accommodate a number of floppy disk formats. Um, and again, because it's interpreting the, or rather capturing the uh, floppy disk data at a lower level in the sector format, you have a better shot at interpreting proprietary, obscure, or otherwise custom disk encodings um, <clears throat> because you can then um, get the raw track data and begin working with it um, sort of offline without having the uh, floppy disk in the disk drive anymore. Um, they do provide some support for flippy disks. Um, I believe you can buy a compatible drive from them, or if you have some customized five and a quarter inch disk drive, um, and they do um, have some guidance and help with uh, reading both sides of, of the platter on a floppy disk. And it can write back to floppy disks, so it can use the stream data to write back those uh, flux transitions that whatever accuracy the device captured it, it can write it back to the floppy disk. And I put that last because I don't imagine that being a high use case for 
special collections and archives, but there could be some cases where uh, you want a very low level uh, uh, of fidelity for emulating, emulating the floppy disk in a compatible emulator, or perhaps a researcher wants to actually use the disk as uh, part of their research. Um, so with that, I will let Sam hand it off to Farrell to describe how it works. Hi, uh, thanks guys. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, the CryoFlux board works. I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds, but I'm going to cover a couple things that I think will be useful. Um, this is a photo of, of the board we have at Duke. Um, it, it can draw power either from the floppy drive, the floppy connector itself, um, or on the ribbon on the left or uh, via the Molex connector in the kind of center right, and then um, connects to an, a USB cable to your machine. The firmware and the drivers are included on the board itself, and the drivers flash load um, to your machine each time you power it up and connect it. Um, as, as Walker mentioned, the CryoFlux board gets data from a, a disk at an exceptionally low level, and the user can direct the board to do a number of things uh, with, with what it reads. Um, these generally fall into two categories that I'm going to talk about. The first is generating stream files, what, what, what the developers call stream files. And the other is instructing the software to parse uh, the data into a, a, a specific disk image subscribing to a, a set of parameters. So stream files are a proprietary format created uh, by the CryoFlux developers. Um, it's, it's not quite raw data, but it's about as close to raw data as you're likely to get. Um, each sector, each track and sector on the disk get its stream file. Uh, these tend to be much larger than the disk images themselves. So if you're working with a 1.44 megabyte floppy disk, stream files for that disk would be around 20 to 25 megabytes. So while that's negligible in this era of mass storage, uh, you're still looking at a footprint of uh, at least an order of magnitude greater if you're thinking about storing these long term. You also can't mount the stream files like you would a disk image, uh, nor can you do a ton with them in their native format. Uh, because again, this is not an open format, it's proprietary, so it's not, I don't think it's useful for long-term preservation, although I think the company sometimes refers to them as preservation uh, stream files. Um, so why would you want to create them? Going back to another point that Walker mentioned, uh, the board allows you to separate that capture of data from its interpretation so you don't have to return to a potentially fragile disk over and over again. So from the stream files, you can generate user, or you can generate disk images of a number of different types. Um, uh, a couple of examples of where this would be useful are if you get a set of disks with very little contextual information, you don't know what kind of computer system they were used in, what time period they date from, you know, what manufacturer they had, that sort of thing. Other times you might think you know enough about it uh, based on time period or manufacturer, and so you make a, you, you tell the software to create a disk image based on that information, and it looks like it's a, a complete disk image and it, will, it may even mount to your file system, um, but when you get down to the actual the level of files, they're either broken or they're not quite right. And, um, if you can return to those stream files to generate a different type of disk image, that's uh, more useful. So the other broad category of things you can instruct the board to do with software is to parse the um, information it's reading into a specific disk image type based on the physical parameters of the disk, such as the number of tracks, uh, the encoding scheme, uh, whether it's uh, single-sided, double-sided, or, or the density of the disk itself. This is a screenshot from the CryoFlux manual uh, listing the, the types of disk images you can kind of create out of the box. If you notice, the last 10 or so of those are related to Commodore business machines um, because I, I, I've gathered that uh, manufacturers for that uh, set of computer systems had different uh, types of disks. But anyway, um, uh, video game uh, preservation is kind of largely driven uh, early software preservation. So like all good tools, uh, you can interact with the CryoFlux software from the command line. Uh, this shows a couple of different examples. You can generate a single disk image if you definitely know what, you're do uh, what you want to create. You can generate multiple disk images from the command line at once as well. But I think what is most useful is, is generating uh, you know, a specific type of disk image um, and then also the stream files to go along with it in case what you're guessing is wrong. Um, the MFM uh, high density floppy disk is one of the more common floppies that we run into. Uh, it was used for a much longer, for a pretty long period of time, um, you know, by the mass uh, community of, of users. Um, so that's our workflow generally has us create that MFM disk image type or attempt to create that disk image type, but then also create the stream files as well so we can go back to them if we need to. 
Um, there's also a, a GUI for the software, and uh, it allows you to do much the same as the command line in terms of disk image creation. Um, you can create multiple types, you can create stream files and disk images at the same time. But there's a couple of other features that are useful. On the left part of that screenshot, you can see a visualization of the log file kind of created in real time as you're uh, trying to create a disk image. Um, so it'll tell you as you're going along if it's finding bad or good sectors, or if, if you've made a, a wrong guess, it will kind of tell you that everything's unformatted, um, so you kind of know as it's going on. If, you've, um, if you need to return to it or not. On the right, you get a couple of different visualizations of data found in each sector. Um, this is a, an example of the scatter plot, showing the scatter plot of the flux transitions. Um, you can see here that uh, there's a little bit of noise in there, but, but the, the lines are generally uh, grouped together, so that, that is likely that there actually is data in that sector. Um, you can also view it as a histogram. Um, these are both useful in identifying whether a particular sector has data, even if that data can't be interpreted by the application at that time. Um, there are a number of resources to look at when learning more about the Cryoflux board. I think Dorothy is going to talk a little bit about that. Okay, thanks, Farrell. Um... Yeah, so um, now that we have heard a little bit from um, Farrell and from um, uh, Walker about um, the how and the why of um, the Cryoflex and why you might, might want to incorporate it into your workflows, um, I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about the, some of the resources that are available out there to help, um, help you do that. And just as a quick caveat, um, I'm going to do this from the perspective of me. Um, who is someone who uh, really started as a beginner. Um, the Cryoflex was completely new to me, and I'm still sort of picking this stuff up as I, as I go along. So apologies to any of you who are already familiar with, with much of the technology behind the Cryoflex. Um, so the, the sort of first and most obvious place to start is the Cryoflex manual. Um, you can find that through a quick Google search. And you'll find information here about um, how to get your Cryoflex set up and how to get started um, capturing uh, the various kinds of disk images. You'll also find some information about the GUI versus the command line um, and the various uh, formats that Cryoflex can handle. So all that being said, um, the manual doesn't go into a great deal of depth, I don't think. Um, it's, a, it's a useful kind of get started guide, but it doesn't go into a huge amount of depth. And depending on your familiarity with um, floppy disk technology, you might have some questions or, or you might run into some issues that aren't necessarily solved here. Um, I definitely did and uh, still do. Um, so there are a few other resources that you might consider when you're working with the Cryoflex. Uh, one of them is the Cryoflex support forums. Um, they cover all kinds of topics um, and can be mined for answers to lots of questions um, and, and troubleshooting. Um, I've not actually posted any questions here. Um, I tend to just kind of mine the forums for answers to questions I'm, I'm coming up against. Um, but you can, um, although I have heard that there's a, a bit of a process for registering for the forum, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure how, how complicated that is. Some, some of you may know. Um, I will say that, at least for me, this forum can be a little bit intimidating. Um, I think it often assumes a higher level of, of technical competency than I possess, um, which might be something to bear in mind, depending on how, how comfortable you are. Um, but it, it shouldn't put you off, certainly. I've often found really useful nuggets of information here, kind of buried between stuff that, that goes straight over my head. Um, in my experience, at least, a bit of digging can get you can get you a good way towards an answer. Um, and if you can't find the answer that you need amongst the existing forum posts, um, and if the idea of publicly posting your question to the many Cryoflex whiz kids who tend to man these forums actually gives you heart palpitations um, and, and not in a, a sort of Valentine's Day kind of way. Um, another option is to send an email to the Cryoflex team. Um, that's something that I've done uh, several times. Um, I, I mean, as I'm sure others of you have experienced, it's not always easy to communicate technical difficulties over email. Um, so it, it's not always been kind of very easy to pinpoint the answer that I'm looking for um, via this channel, but it's been, it's been a great option for sort of getting me closer. Um, and there's certainly been occasions where it's been really, really helpful. So um, emailing the guys at Cryofax is a great option. Um, they're always 
really keen to help. So these are the um, official channels of support, um, and they each provide useful resources when working with the Cryoflex. Um, in all honesty, though, the, the most useful resource I have found um, when working with the Cryoflex is a man called uh, Dave. Um, Dave is a vintage computing enthusiast and an experienced Cryoflex user. Um, and while I, I didn't really think it would be fair to start distributing Dave's contact details as part of a list of Cryoflex resources, um, what I will say is that I met Dave through a local retro computing club um, through which I have got to know an incredibly knowledgeable and helpful and really engaged and um, crucially very patient group of people um, to whom I have asked so many questions. Um, so that's something that I would also encourage. If, if you feel like you could use some extra help with some of these uh, less common technologies and tools like, like the Cryoflex, um, and, and it would be useful to be, at, be, be able to actually talk to a, a, a human in person, um, I would encourage you to reach out to similar clubs in your area because it's been, it's been really helpful to, to us here. Um, so to, to close on this a uh, wee section on resources. I, I wanted to put out a, a sort of quick question to you all and to anyone else that you know who uses or, or might be interested in using the Cryoflex in their work. Um, as you may have sort of uh, surmised by now, um, there, there isn't really a great deal of documentation or resources about the Cryoflex that's, that's tailored towards an archivist audience. Um, and for me, at least, um, I think this could be uh, sort of a bit of a barrier to use, could, could make a, uh, life a little bit difficult. Um, so I'd, I'd really love to get your thoughts on this. Um, it's something that uh, I've talked about with others, Farrell and Walker and, and other people um, in the past, is a need for, for a little guide to the Cryoflex that's sort of specifically for archivists. Um, so I've, I've included my email address here, and I'd love to hear from you if you have specific questions that you think need to be addressed in, in something like that, or if there are particular gaps in information that you think need addressing, um, or if you think a guide like this is completely unnecessary and stupid, um, I'd like to hear that too, or anything else, um, I'd love to hear from you um, so we can begin thinking about how we might develop some additional resources. So um, please either drop me an email or you can use the chat window here um, to send any ideas or comments or questions my way. Um, I'd love to love to hear your thoughts. Um, so with that, um, we're going to move on to a few examples of how Farrell and Walker and I have used the Cryoflex in our work. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start with some of my work here at Emory. Um, so the, the Software Preservation Society um, pitches the Cryoflex uh, towards institutions that are encountering aging floppy disks not easily read by current disk drives, as um, Walker described. Um, and, and as Walker talked about, um, in contrast to other approaches to forensic imaging, the, the Cryoflex recognizes numerous disk formats, um, including early and unusual formats. Um, you can indicate the correct format of the disk if you know it, and the Cryoflex will capture an image based on that format. If you don't know it, you can select Cryoflex extreme format. Um, and that, as, as Farrell was describing, will read the data as an uncompressed wall stream generated by uh, the flux transition on, on the media. So this ability to, to capture images of obscure or unrecognizable disk format make it an incredibly useful tool um, here at Emory. Um, another advantage to the, to the Cryoflex is its ability to um, handle media suffering from degradation or bit rot. Our most common use case for the Cryoflex here at Emory is exactly that, um, capturing disk images from aging disks that are in bad condition um, where other imaging methods have failed. We don't typically start with the Cryoflex because um, the Cryoflex creates um, IMG files, and we can't ingest these files into our digital repository. And so the transformation of, of these files into a format that can be handled by our repository um, it necessitates an extra step in our workflow that we'll avoid if, if possible. Um, but nonetheless, this is a really useful um, application of the Cryoflex, and it's allowed us to, to capture data that otherwise we, we might have lost. Um, today, what I wanted to focus on is another example of how we've used the Cryoflex um, here at the Rose Library. Um, in 2006, what is what is now the Stuart A. Rose Manuscript Archives and Rabbit Library, um, and what was then Marble, 
acquired the papers of poet and author Lucille Clifton. Um, as part of the acquisition, our digital archives unit received um, Clifton's Magnavox video writer, a word processing machine produced in the mid 1980s along with five of the video writers, uh, three and a half inch floppy disks. So early appraisal um, discovered that there were valuable files on the floppy disks, um, but their proprietary video writer formatting presented a real challenge when it came to capturing that data. Imaging configurations using um, US, sort of modern USB floppy disk drives failed to recognize um, this rather obscure proprietary formatting um, and as a result we, we couldn't capture and process forensic disk images of the disk content using our usual workflows. So this then was a case where we knew the formatting of the disks um, but we didn't have a tool or a configuration of tools that were capable of recognizing it. So using Cryoflex's stream format um, we were able to capture the low-level flux information from each of Clifton's five disks. Um, now because the stream format makes no attempt to interpret this low-level flux information um, in order to identify the encoding format. You do lose the um, color-coded block information that Farrell described earlier um, and that you would normally see in the, in the GUI, um, as you see highlighted in red on, on the slide here. Um, instead, as you might expect, all blocks will be gray, just signifying that it's an unknown format. That said, um, and as Farrell described, the GUI does provide a visualization of the flux data um, as, a, as a scatter plot. Um, and if you're the sort of person who knows how to interpret flux data as represented in a scatter plot, um, these can help diagnose media or hardware problems. Um, or at least that's what I've been told. Um, if, like me, you're not the sort of person who um, can look at a graph like that and interpret the flux data, um, these can at least draw your attention to where there might be problems. Um, even if you're not able to sort of fully diagnose them, you, you can get a, get a sense that they're there. So in the case of the Clifton Video Writer Disc, um, these graphs alerted us almost immediately during imaging to the, the possibility that one of our disks might have a, a problem or that it at least didn't look the same as the other video writer disks. So during the imaging process for four of the five video writer disks, our scatter plot graphs looked something um, like this. But the fifth looked like this. Um, so I was able to observe the difference, even if I wasn't able to necessarily interpret it. Um, you can see that the, the primary band for this disc hovers um, at around the eight mark, um, unlike the other four discs where the primary band hovers um, around the four or, or 4.5. So at the very least, this alerted me to the fact that there was potentially something different about this fifth disc, even if I couldn't be entirely sure what it was. It certainly didn't seem to be encoded in the same way as the, the other disks. So I consulted with Dave, um, who I had previously, um, as I said, met through our local Atlanta vintage computing enthusiast group. Um, and he suggested that it might not be a video writer disk after all, but rather a disk encoded for some other unknown system. Um, we shared screenshots of the, of the scatter plots on the Cryofx forum or rather he did, um, because he's not as scared of it as I am. Um, and while it wasn't a pattern that anyone recognized, um, we were at least able to surmise that it, it wasn't a blank disk. Um, so my next step has been to contact the Cryoflex developers, uh, just on the off chance that they can help me identify the platform for which this mystery disk might be formatted. Um, and so we'll, we'll sort of see what comes of that. Um, but you can see that even though I might not have sort of extensive knowledge of, of floppy disk technology and encoding, um, the Cryoflex can, can provide some really useful clues as to what I'm working with. And those clues can sometimes help point me towards the, the right people and the right resources needed for further diagnosis. Um, of course, we're not always going to have the time and resources necessary to, to put this level, level of effort into identifying the format of a single disk. But I would argue that even in those cases, um, it's useful to be able to provide some information both um, for your own records and for your researchers that goes some way towards explaining why, why the disk might remain unreadable or unprocessed. So um, to return to our five video writer disks, at the very least, um, and in spite of some of the remaining questions, we have a set of stream files that 
provide mm, for preservation in uh, in air quote copies of the data um, and and reduce our reliance at least on aging and degrading media and hardware. Um, these copies are now stored in our digital preservation repository. Um, and any additional action that we choose to take um, for, for preservation or for access can be done using these copies rather than the original disk. This solution, however, can only can only take us so far in achieving sufficient um, levels of preservation. Well, we have managed to overcome challenges relating to the, the degradation of the old media. We're still left, as, as Farrell pointed out earlier, with data that's stored using um, a proprietary format. So it, it buys us some time, at least in terms of preservation. Um, the the big the, the big problem that does remain, of course, is that we we still have this sizable barrier to providing researcher access. Um, today, our attempts at solving this problem have been really unsustainable in the long term, um, and and these frustrations kind of highlight a, a bit of a gap in in our digital archive tool set. Um, my friend Dave um, did help us identify a handful of resources that might um, advance our efforts to extract the data from our stream formatted image files. Um, but these resources are, are pretty few in number and, and they really far from guarantee a long term solution. Um, on the whole, they require that um, our unprocessed data be sent to external groups um, and rely heavily on the willingness of enthusiasts and developers to collaborate with us on what is really a rather narrow and obscure project um, outside of our efforts. I'm not sure that there is great demand for a tool capable of rendering Magnavox video writer files. So in the meantime, and in lieu of any clear alternative solution, we resorted to printing the content of each disk using Clifton's original video writer while it's still in good working order. Um, and luckily we'd received spare ink cartridges with the, the video writer. Um, so we were able to use the video writer's built-in printer. Um, so we spent a couple of days printing um, and then we worked with the library's digitization team to scan the printed pages and run OCR in order to create digital access copies of Clifton's files. And like our other processed born digital collections, um, these scan files are now available to our researchers at dedicated laptops in our reading room. Despite these complications, we hope still to find some way of working with the stream formatted um, image files at some point. Um, until then, however, um, printing as unsophisticated um, as it is, at least provides some access, however inadequate, um, to the content of, of four of Clifton's five video writer discs. For now, at least the fifth disc remains a mystery. Um, and while it may be tempting to think of the video writer discs as, as kind of rare cases, um, the challenges associated with aging media mean that archivists may end up with stream formatted image files with some regularity, um, and, and tools such as the Cryoflex that enable archivists to process and manage aging disks with obsolete formatting are invaluable to the, the field of digital archives. But that said, there are, there are still these kind of gaps that we need to navigate in, in the tools available to us and, and in how we're um, applying them if, if, we're able, if we're going to be able to deliver some of these really valuable cultural artifacts to, to our researcher communities who want to use them. Um, so that's everything from me, and I'm going to pass over now to um, Farrell, who's going to talk about some of their work at Duke. Hey, thanks, Dorothy. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how the Cryoflux fits into our acquisitions workflow, and then discuss the use of the board in appraising a collection of floppies with uh, little contextual information and a fair amount of data degradation. So this is a, a zoomed out view of our appraisal process. This is mainly created to help me and our technical services archivists decide how to initially treat media in a collection. This came out of a couple of places. First, we have an AV archivist whose workflow for um, audiovisual media differs from mine. Um, and second, and maybe more broadly, or more importantly, um, staff in technical services tend to think of electronic records as this monolithic thing. Um, even though materials received on different carriers require different treatments, and then sometimes the same carrier type uh, requires different treatments depending on the collection. So this is really a high-level decision tree to help staff determine whether we need to commit to a, creating a disk image, if so, when do we do it, and then a pointer to applications and next steps for analysis. 
Um, we uh, run a desktop PC that dual boots Windows 7 and BitCurator. We have three and a half and five and a quarter inch drives with common floppy connectors. We store our Cryoflux board in a 3D imprinted enclosure. We got the design from Yale, although it's on Thingiverse now. We found that disconnecting the cable after each use could lead to mishandling of the board, depending on how gentle the user is. Um, at the moment, most of our disk imaging is performed on the Windows partition for a couple of different reasons. First, um, when we're working with students, especially undergraduates, um, but sometimes graduate students too, getting them to a level of comfort with a Linux interface is somewhat tricky. If I had one student working uh, with me for an entire semester, that would change things. But we generally work with undergrads um, on a project-by-project -project basis, uh, for which training them on software in Windows reduces the number of things they have to acclimate to. Second reason, uh, specifically to Cryoflux, is that, um, as Dorothy mentioned, the, the, the forums are somewhat intimidating. The developers are not always that supportive. This is a, a post um, from a couple years ago where they were basically just telling you not to not to use it in Linux if you if you didn't have to. I know they offer a version of the Linux uh, software, and anecdotally, I think Walker has gotten it to work in Linux, and maybe Jared at Princeton too. I know some people have. I was not able to last time I tried. Um, the forums were not very much help. Uh, they've released a new version of the software software since January, and I, I plan to return to it. But for right now, everything we're doing with Cryoflux is on the Windows side. Shifting to uh, a collection of material that arrived around the time I started in 2013, the Virginia Barber Literary Agency records came to us uh, from a Duke PhD alum who ran her own agency for a quarter century or so. That, that agency worked with a number of prominent authors, including Alice Munro and Michael Chabon and Anita Shreve. Um, it was a hybrid collection, as so many things are. The digital portion uh, consisted of around 100 five and a quarter inch disks and a handful of three and a half inch. Some of the five and a quarter inch floppies shared sleeves with one another, and I can't speak to the storage conditions at the donor's home, but I doubt they were optimal for digital media. Um, there was no documentation coming along with the disks. Our curator had asked uh, Dr. Barber questions about the types of computers her office had used, um, but she either did not know ever or could not remember uh, now. Um, looking at the manufacturer labels and some of the handwritten labels, you can see in the photo that um, she had some Tandy manufactured disks. Uh, there's an Apple Writer label toward the bottom of that, if you can read it. So she was probably using Apple computers at some point. The Tandy disks could have been used in a Tandy machine, or they could have been reformatted for uh, use in other systems. Um, we don't have an FC 5025, so there was no way to appraise uh, contents prior to, to disk imaging, so we tried to do a pass with the Cryoflux. This is a photograph. Um, typically of many of the disks, uh, if you can see on the second handwritten line, it sort of says archived GL data disk. A number of disks said GL or GL backup on them. Um, I'm going to chalk this up to my own inexperience at the time, but I initially tried to image all of these disks as MFM encoded disks, which is not quite right for the time period and not really right for the form uh, for the actual. Um, type of disk at all. Um, so as you can see from this log file, uh, this was an initial failure. Um, it, it, the DTT software attempted to parse each sector as an MFM disk. It could not do so, so it reports that every sector on both sides as unformatted. Um, luckily, uh, as we talked earlier, both uh, the command line and, and GUI um, allow you to create uh, multiple types of disk images at once. Um, so for each disk, I actually created um, a set of uh, stream files as well as the these useless empty MFM disk image files. So the next step then is to, to uh, experiment converting stream files to different uh, disk image types. Um, and here's some things I learned about working with stream files. You can look at the scatter plots to see where data exists or doesn't exist or should exist, um, and, where, and where it does exist if decay may also be present. So the foreground image here uh, is showing a sector that is unformatted, unformatted on this Apple DOS um, image. The scatter plot in the foreground shows that the sector is most likely unwritten. It's all noise. There's no signal really there. Um, the highlighted sector in the background image is a sector that the application read as bad, though the scatter plot shows that, that there is some uniformity to the, the, um, the fluxes there. Um, so there's probably data. It, it, it's clear. There is still some, some variation, so it, it may be noisy or, or uh, corrupted in, in some way. Um, on this slide, the scatter plots here show uh, where data is found even if the disk image that the software is trying to create is incorrect. Um, so the example here is the result of passing the same stream files through multiple disk image encodings. Uh, in the background, I processed the stream files as an Apple DOS of 3.3, I think is the specific parameters. Um, and you can see a mix of, of good and bad uh, sectors there. Um, 
this, the foreground image is the same set of stream files processed as a later Apple DOS image. Um, and although the highlighted sector there shows that um, uh, that there is some trace of data. The data cannot be parsed as that type of disk image. So in the, um, on the left-hand side of that window, you see that everything is reported as unformatted. Um, in this case, I was able to parse a sample of the disks as old Apple disks using that 3.3 parameter. Unfortunately, there were too many bad sectors to get uh, for the disks to be fully salvaged. They were not mountable um, uh, or openable with HFS Explorer or some of the other tools that we have. Um, that said, there were some things that I was able to glean. So opening the files, uh, the disk images as files in a hex editor gave some view of the data that was still there or, or viewable. In this view, you can see along the left-hand side uh, the names of some of the clients or potential clients that the agency worked with. So Alice Monroe and Anita Shreve are both there. Um, I think the second view gives you a better indication of what the disk might have contained. The top line reads cache and author's account. And then um, uh, later in the thing, you can see sort of accounting information, gains and losses. Um, so this is an assumption, but it's at least an informed or educated assumption that the, that the term GL data, returning back to this uh, label here, refers to gain loss data. And since a large number of the disks labeled with this um, indicate that it's accounting information, so now we can make a determination whether to spend more time recovering, uh, you know, accounting information for the agency, or if we can try and prioritize the disks that are not labeled with this. Some of the three and a half inch floppies that we were able to recover had um, drafts of work and, and correspondence with with uh, clients, which I think is more valuable to the collection overall. Um, so the main takeaway here is that even though we weren't able to fully recover the data or data recovery is unlikely without um, an, a huge resource expense, um, using the stream files and parsing them even as, as uh, incomplete disk images allowed us to make informed decisions um, about the collection and where to expend processing resources going forward. Um, that's what I have. I'm going to pass things over to Walker now. I can find it. Ah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Carl. Um, so for the last use case uh, study, um, I'm going to focus on using Cryoflux for immediate triage and then subsequent uh, batch processing of the outputs from, from Cryoflux. Um, uh, what I'm going to look at here is uh, one of our really largest collections of born digital media, the Woody and Stana Volsuka collection. This is a media artist couple uh, that began work in the mid 60s and are still still working today. Um, so throughout their career, they've been heavy users of technology and have really been using computing technology since the mid 70s. Um, <clears throat> we've got just over a thousand floppies. Um, date ranges from sometime before 1980 to, uh, to 2012. Um, all the physical media is integral to the collection, so the floppies are going to be retained. Uh, a lot of these floppies have third-party software on them, but we're going to keep them um, at the moment uh, as evidence of the artist's tools. Um, and we do know that there are a lot of different uh, file systems uh, uh, scattered throughout this collection, although the majority of the file systems are uh, file allocation table 12, a very uh, common uh, PC file system. The environment here is a Linux box with, with Bitcurator on it. That's the uh, machine on the right. Um, we have a few different uh, five and a quarter, three and a half, and one eight inch drive. Um, to move through the floppy disk in this collection, which do incorporate those uh, three different uh, floppy disk formats. And we've got the Cryoflux board and software, of course. Um, so the goals for this particular collection uh, was to generate an inventory of all the disks, get all the data off the disk, um, track the results of this work uh, in a spreadsheet, and I think very critically to use student help uh, to do this in a realistic uh, time frame. <clears throat> um, so our process here was to train the students on how to attach the cryoflux to the host computer, um, to calibrate the drive, and to generate log files, which uh, I'll touch on a little bit more in just a moment. 
As a default, uh, we had the students use the Cryoflux stream files, the preservation uh, uh, format, along with the MFM sector images. Farrell was uh, uh, mentioned a moment ago, that's a very common sector image format. And so as a first guess, it's, it's got a pretty good rate. Um, and the benefit here, again, is that when you select these multiple formats, you get uh, the ability to um, tell the software or the device, rather, to try again um, on certain sectors. So I think the default number of retries is maybe five, but you can go into settings and you can change that. So for the majority of the disks that the students were moving through, um, we did get to try multiple times on the sectors, and oh, in many cases, we got a positive read where we didn't on the initial run. Uh, they were trained, the students were trained to run uh, <coughs> different sector image formats against the stream files, a few likely candidates like Apple DOS. Um, but if something was problematic, um, that would be noted in the spreadsheet, and I'd have to come back to it and, and check it out um, because it gets you know, more and more time intensive um, uh, uh, as you move away from MFM. Um, and then we use the BitCurator Bit reporting tool um, without bulk extractor at the moment uh, to complete uh, reporting. So the spreadsheet I mentioned tracks the student user or myself that uh, was doing the disk imaging any bad sectors, whether or not the resulting Disk image, uh, that single disk image file was mountable. What disk drive we used, because again, we have a number of three and a half and five and a quarters, which are all labeled. Um, and in some cases, we have better luck with a disk drive on a certain run of disk than another disk drive. Um, <clears throat> and in many cases, also, it was just recalibrating the disk drive. Um, and of course, the date when that happened. We are keeping the raw tracks at the moment. Um, there's about 200 disks that do not have disk images. So we're keeping the raw tracks, but we anticipate removing them um, at a later point before they go into our repository. Uh, the students took a cursory note of the contents, and then Bagot was used to, to, to wrap all this up and put it um, on secure servers. So the result of this process with Cryoflux was we got about 800 of these floppy disks mountable. Um, we got, at, out of the 800 that were mountable, uh, as, it, as I said earlier, most were FAT12. A few were Apple disks, the hierarchical file system, uh, one Linux disk, and a couple of, or a handful of um, Digital Equipment Corporation PDP 8-inch uh, disks. Um, the student notes uh, were very effective in locating particularly interesting data to extract, to sort of uh, demonstrate the value of the collections to other folks, um, you know, early computer-generated graphics and things like that that are, you know, very um, fun to look at. Um, so they were able to um, locate that data very well. Um, of course, with this many floppy disks, the overall shape and state is kind of remains obscure. Um, so as an example of some of the batch processing that we've kind of played around with after this immediate triage phase, um, I put together a very, uh, very basic script to um, aggregate the file system events across the floppy disks, which has been useful. And one of our students um, wrote a script to translate the, the log file that uh, Farrell showed, showed us earlier to a table that's a, a little more legible uh, for folks. Um, and I don't put these up um, to suggest that they're professional level scripts because they're emphatically not, but um, I do want to just illustrate that um, once the immediate triage is done, it opens the door to some, some pretty neat batch processing. So this is uh, one of the outputs from that previous, uh, the file system event aggregator script. Um, and it was very useful to me just to um, have an idea about <laughs> when this uh, uh, collection began and when it ended. Um, I know that there are disks that um, were being used before 1980, but you know, just looking at the collection, I knew it spanned it, it spanned several decades, but I didn't really know where. 
And so now that I've aggregated them, I actually have a, a rough date range for when people were using these disks, when the artists or their, or their help were using the disk. Um, and this is an example of an output from the second script, moving the, um, the log, the Chronoflux log data to uh, a more uh, sort of reportable, legible uh, tabular format that I think would be useful for reporting, um, you know, to other folks what the state of the collection is and counting the, the bad uh, sectors and, and so on. Um, and that is uh, it for me. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks, Walker. And thank you, Farrell. And thank you, Dorothy. Um, so as a segue into q and A, I'm going to open it up for, for Cal to speak briefly about um, Cryoflux and, and Big Curator. Go for it, Cal. Um, sure. So I just wanted to point out, um, I mean, I'm really excited about this event for a number of reasons. One, that everybody took the lead on these terrific talks and demonstrations, um, but also just that um, I think it's very clear that the BCC is becoming this, you know, community forum where we can discuss things that aren't just BitCurator specific. Um, if anybody has questions about running the software in the BitCurator environment, I'm sure we can answer those. I know Cam's on the call. You saw that obviously it's more supported and designed to be run in a Windows environment, but I think probably more important to BitCurator users is what happens with the stream and then associated image files as opposed to whether the software runs directly in the BitCurator environment, but that's for all of you to tell. Um, and I guess I'd finally just say, is everybody hearing just awful echo from me? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. that. I'll say one more thing and shut up, which is that we're really interested in more thoughts from people about which of these advanced seminars will help people. So, you know, let us know um, if there are other things along these lines. We've got one in the works that'll probably be coming out in the next few months on more advanced bulk extractor activities. But, um, you know, this is where we're moving, is having these forums where we can all get together as members of the consortium and talk about practices that people have. So uh, I just want to express my thanks to, um, to Dorothy and Walker and Farrell and just obviously see if anybody has any questions. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to shout them out. Just be sure to, to unmute your mic over there on the right before before speaking. Um, Kari, I saw that you chatted something, but you chatted it just to me privately. So I could either share it in the chat or feel free to speak up if you want. Yeah, okay, so anyway, I, yeah, I just noticed that that only went up to you. Um, so my question was for Dorothy Farrell and um, Matthew also. You guys are, were sort of all basically mentioning that you keep the stream files as well as the, um, then the produced disk image files, but not necessarily thinking about you need it long term, but you certainly, and I agree, like need it for the short term. Um, but are you thinking about that as like part of what would be an AIP? Or are you thinking that as sort of like maybe those are separate? Or just thinking about, you know, the issue of how we package things and then thinking about going back to them in the future and then thinking about the accessioning, the practicalities of that? I mean, it, I, I believe it's probably not as much enough of it yet to really think about the 20-year, 30-year, 40-year implications. But I'm just curious what, um, what you guys have thought about so far with doing that. Carol, you can so, start. Yeah, so I have no interest in keeping them long term, just be, because of the proprietary nature. And if we can get a, you know, a, an IMG, the kind of raw disk image file, that's going to be a better preservation object, I think, in the long term. Um, yeah, so the, the the kind of example that I was talking about was a, a thing where I created the stream files and then I was pretty inexperienced, so I just kind of let it sit. So they were, I guess, in this sort of like limbo, not really an AIP, not part of the AIP, but but you know, kind of in this limbo of work in progress for a while until I returned to that project. And for yeah, us, the I, oh, I'm sorry, Walker. No, go ahead. <laughs> um, for us, the the only instance where we have kept the um, dream files as part of the ape is um, the Lucille Clifton example where that's all we have right now. Um, so yeah, otherwise 
we're not considering that part of the part of the aim. Yeah, and I, I think we've got a roughly the same sort of policy here. Um, we're in the process of, of putting a, a digital repository down. Um, so these are um, all in the anticipation that they will go into a repository. Um, and the, the, the stream files are <clears throat> just retained at the moment for further diagnostics um, to see if maybe we can remove a few of the bad sectors that are still available, uh, that are still present on some of the disk images, um, but I wouldn't want to include the stream files in an AIP uh, because they're so cumbersome. Um, it's a format that's still being adjusted by the Crime Flux folks, um, and even they don't characterize it as a preservation format. And the only exception there would be if I simply cannot get any kind of mountable disk image from you know those 80 or so tracks, then I feel like I've got no other recourse but to put that in AIP and um, you know come back to it at a later point in time. So, Laura, to answer your other your question, is it impossible to migrate stream files to another more usable format? The, the application allows you to um, parse the stream to, to tell the the. Uh, the software to uh, convert the stream file to one of the disk image types that's supported, um, but uh, I don't think there's a there's not like an open version of Cryoflux stream file. If that makes sense, if that answers your question. Any other questions from those attending, listening in? Going once. Going twice. Okay, great. Well, I mean, if, if something comes to mind clearly, um, please post to the, the BCC list or feel free to contact any of these folks directly. Um, yeah, I'll echo Cal and say uh, it, this is a really great uh, sharing of member experiences. Um, and if people were into this format, um, we can definitely look towards more, more, uh, more things like this for future webinars um, on things like advanced bulk extractor application, um, other things that you all chimed in on in the survey last fall. So uh, we'll be announcing the next one uh, probably within a couple weeks or so, um, just sort of figuring out which one we're gonna do next. Um, and yeah, hope, hope to see some more of you on future webinars. Um, so thanks again for attending and hope everyone has a nice weekend.